Every evening before we meditate as a group, we have to chant on goodwill. And it's not just an idle sentiment. It's something that we forms the basic motivation for our practice. May I be happy. And we're not talking about just any old kind of happiness. We want true happiness. That's why we're here. Seeing the kind of happiness that the world outside has to offer, and it just doesn't really give any true satisfaction. It doesn't stay with us. We want a happiness that stays. A happiness that's not subject to change, not subject to time. And there's only one place we can find that when we look down into the mind. This is why we're meditating. This is why we're training the mind. Because an important part of the meditation, an important part of the training, is getting the right mind ready for the meditation in terms of the way we conduct our lives. We have to build good habits outside, and then they start showing up inside. This is why the Buddha starts out with the precepts, teaching you to be very careful about the impact of your actions, the things you do, the things you say. Make sure they don't harm anyone. They don't damage anyone. This requires that you be really careful about your intentions, because the precepts are designed around intentions. For instance, the precept on not killing. Now, if you happen to step on an ant unintentionally, or without knowing about it, or without the idea that you're planning to kill it, okay, the precept isn't broken. That means the focus is more on your intention as the source of the action, as the source of what you have to be careful about in the action. And that begins to focus your attention on what's really important in your life, is the intentions that shape what you do, because what you do then in turn shapes your experiences. And if you're not skillful, it turns, a, turns into a downward spiral. So you have to take a good look at your life to see which parts of your life are actually antithetical to the meditation, and straighten them out. Get them more in line with what you're planning to do here. In addition to the precepts, the Buddha talks about general principles of action, gentle, general principles of behavior, like truthfulness. Like being energetic, putting extra effort in what you do to make sure you do it right. Not just hoping you can slip by with a minimum amount of input, a minimum amount of effort. That kind of attitude shows, starts showing up in your meditation. And whenever a problem comes up in the meditation, you start taking the lazy way out. So you have to look at the habits that you're developing, above and beyond the precepts, to see which ones are conducive to the practice and which ones are not. Because after all, it's the same mind. The mind that's sitting here meditating right now is the same mind that gives the orders when you're out acting among people. So you want to make sure that your habits are also in line with the fact that you're a meditator, that, you're, that you practice, training the mind. It all has to be aimed at that, that goal. What is true happiness? Not just little bits of ease that you can sneak in here and there, but then change into something else. You want something that's really solid, which means that you have to be solid in your behavior. Once you look at your daily life and you say, yeah, this is solid. You're reliable, dependable. All those virtues that don't have a lot of flashing lights, but they do find they do provide a good foundation for the practice. Then you find it's a lot easier to settle down and get good results about out of the action of sitting here focusing on your breath, keeping the mind with the breath, because the habits you develop outside are present right here. We're developing habits of mindfulness, alertness, what the Buddha called ardency. In other words, you really are here to improve the qualities of your mind. 
because it's through the qualities of the mind that things make a difference. The training does make a difference. It's interesting that when the Buddha, towards the end of his life, gave a summary of his important teachings, it was all qualities of mind. He didn't say, well, you have to believe this or you have to believe that, above and beyond just the principle of the power of your actions. He didn't tell his followers, okay, you have to believe, believe that the world is round or the cosmos is finite or the cosmos is infinite or it's made out of atoms or whatever, none of that stuff. It's all belief that, okay, based on qualities of mind, you want to develop conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. You work on these, and as you work on these, they begin to make a difference. The one thing he asked you to believe was in the principle of karma, and that what you do makes a difference. So as you're sitting here meditating, it's not just you're sitting here waiting for something to come down and touch you on the head, or for somehow things to finally fit together without your doing anything, without your being observant. You have to be observant. You have to do the, do the meditation. And it is a doing. It's subtle and it's refined, but there is a doing there. The more you're aware of that doing, that's what leads to awakening. And this is an aspect of the mind that we tend to be pretty much in the dark about, so we have to bring it into the light of day. Be very clear about what you're doing, how you're focusing on the breath, how the breath feels. Notice when the mind slips off from the breath, when it's getting ready to slip off. When it's beginning to settle down, notice how it settles down, the different ways it can settle down. These are all things that you have to watch for. Things that make your alertness a lot clearer, make you more alert to what's going on. And your alertness becomes a better tool. All these things the Buddha teaches are tools. The Four Noble Truths are tools. Teachings on virtue, concentration, and discernment, these are tools. It's interesting that when he talks about his awakening, he says, you know, certain knowledge does arise. But again, the knowledge he learned during his awakening, he used that as a tool as well, to free the mind. And this is how he claimed that he, he wasn't stuck on particular views. In other words, he used views, he used knowledge as a tool. But he realized that that wasn't the essence of his awakening, it was the means to his awakening. And the awakened mind itself, the released mind, okay, that was what lay at the essence. So we're here working on tools, getting skillful in our tools. The qualities of mind we're working on, learn to use the breath as a tool. Learn to use feelings of pleasure and pain as they arise in your meditation. Learn to use those as tools as well. We tend to think of pain as something we want to run away from, pleasure as something we want to hold on to as an end in and of itself. It's probably one of the most revolutionary teachings the Buddha had was that you use it as a tool. The pleasure that comes from your meditation when the mind finally begins to settle down. gets more and more solid in its concentration. The fact that it feels good, you Part of you will want to get attached to it, and that's okay in the beginning. But then after a while you begin to realize, okay, there's a use for this. It's not just a nice place to hang out. But the concentrated mind is a good place to start seeing deeper into the processes of the mind. So that feeling of ease, sometimes feelings of rapture, these become tools as well. Even insight into the Four Noble Truths, that ultimately is a tool a way of looking at things that helps you break free from attachments. So this is very much a, a doing practice, but it's a very subtle doing. It starts from your outside actions and moves on into the actions of the mind. It finally settles in on the real issues, how the mind does things that cause itself suffering, which are a suffering that's not necessary, a stress and a strain, pain, that are really not necessary. And 
when you can learn to see through those habits and abandon those habits. That's when the practice shows its real results. And that's when you really are showing goodwill for yourself, because up to that point you're still making yourself suffer in ways that you don't have to. But until you use virtue, concentration, and discernment as tools to get down to why this is happening, so you can see for yourself that you don't have to identify with certain patterns. It's always amazing to realize how sometimes really negative, negative patterns in the mind. There's a part of you that wouldn't know who you were without them, would feel lost without them. Well, why is that? Virtue, concentration, and discernment are the tools for finding out. And the more you work with them, as with any tool, the more you work with them, the more skillful you become. The more skillful you become, the more you see. So even though it does require work, and it many times requires really heavy, heavy effort, but it's all worthwhile, and it's all a way of showing true goodwill for yourself, true compassion for yourself. So it's always important to keep that in mind, that that's the motivation for what we're doing here. And Buddhism is a serious pursuit of true happiness, with the emphasis on the serious and on the true. It takes our good old American principle there and moves it up a notch to make it something really worthwhile. 